Thank you very much uh, for, for coming along and it's uh, great to see uh, some, some people from other schools uh, uh, at, at, at our seminar. Uh, so this uh, is a report on the first um, sort of seven, seven, eight months of a project uh, which is part of the Honeybee CRC. Um, and basically, what, what we've been do doing over this uh, eight-month period is trying to get, get our heads around this very complex and really internationally fairly unique, uh, well, yeah, unique industry um, that there is in, in Western Australia. So the rest of the world has, has bees, but they're, they're usually managed for pollination, or largely for, for pollination. And uh, they, they take advantage of a relatively small number of agricultural crops. Things in Western Australia are, are quite different. Um, and also the honey is quite different, as you will find out, I hope. <laughs> Uh, wh when you run through the, uh, the taste testing at, at the end, which has been kindly set up by my co-author co here, which is, who is uh, Cheryl Day, so I should, should introduce Cheryl. Um, so this is, this is the uh, title of our project under, under the CRC for honeybee products. Um, and specifically what the project is trying to do is to understand how we value apiary sites, which are actually actually owned by all of us because they're, they're actually provided by the government through the Department of uh, Biodiversity, uh, Conservation and Attractions. I'm never sure what the attractions are. But anyway. uh, I have a Ferris wheels, possibly. Um, uh, so it's, it's trying to understand the, the value of those, those apiary sites um, and because the apiary sites are all based on native vegetation, then they're, they're subject to all the threat processes that are, that are uh, our native vegetation is subject to. So fragmentation, uh, accidental fires, intention, prescribed burning, and so on. So, um, and so we're, we're trying to make some sense of that. And, and so I suppose the, the, the start of the project is just trying to understand the industry. Um, and the more we looked into the industry, then actually the stranger it became and the more complicated it became. But uh, I'll leave you to sort of judge that. So the, the outline of the presentation is, well, what's the project aim? I've pretty well done that. Uh, and then we're going to spend some time just uh, looking at some some information that we have about the honey industry in Western Australia. Uh, and then I'm going to describe a theoretical model from the literature, uh, which one of the co-authors was James Wylan. Um, uh, and so that's quite a useful starting point, but, uh, but I don't think that's applicable to Western Australia, so we probably need another, another model. Um, and then uh, if, uh, if, the, if the computer gods are on my side, then we'll, we'll do a, bee, a simulation of a beehive. And uh, our current version of what uh, an apiary site looks like in, in Western Australia. And then I'll say a bit about what we plan to do next, because I'd love to have your feedback on what we, what we should do. Okay, so project aim, determine evaluation of apiary sites by WA region. And uh, the, um, the honey industry in Western Australia is dominated by uh, a, set of, a set of characters, I would say. And I'd say Tiffany is one of the characters. So Tiffany, you probably don't know, is the UWA beekeeper. She's also... Uh, an expert at breeding queen bees. How much do you think you'd pay for a queen bee? How much? That won't buy. No, it's two thousand. 
So, so Tiffany breeds these queen bees on rot nest. And the reason she breeds them on rot nest is it's away from other bees. So it keeps the, <laughs> keeps the undesirable drones away. Okay. So how, how do we start to make some sense of, of honey, honey production? So, so in Western Australia, honey production is an ecosystem service derived from native vegetation. Uh, pollination is, is also uh, an important part of the, the, the bee business, but in Western Australia, unlike many place, other places in the world, it's actually separated from, from honey production. And uh, many beekeepers actually keep their bees away from agriculture because, they, for one thing, they don't want the canola, um, they don't particularly want canola nectar. Although canola makes good, good honey, it, it uh, clogs up their hives and they don't, they don't want to be uh, problems with pesticide contamination and that sort of thing. Uh, currently it's a small, a small industry uh, in Western Australia, so it's running about, at about, uh, about $40 million a year revenue. It's a bit hard to say because so much honey is sold through farmers markets and, and, and informal channels. So. But uh, I think the reason that the, um, you, you know, under, under Liz Barber's leadership, so Liz is here, uh, I, th I think she, she recognised and the industry recognised that there's actually massive potential here. So it could easily go from a $40 million a year industry into one that is possibly, you know, half, half a billion dollars or more. Now, what, what's, what's, my, what's the basis of my optimism? Well, they, they did it in New Zealand with manuka, manuka honey. Um, but a, actually, uh, manuka, which is a, a, a bush species, um, there's, there's plenty of honey that can be produced in Australia, which is of similar, has, has the same sort of antibacterial properties so so that's where that's where the growth has come from but there's also uh, as you'll taste there's also uh, an increasing interest in export markets for good quality honey which is you know, can, can be reasonably claimed to be or, organic um, so there's there's markets in markets in China and Asia um, uh, threats to the threats to the industry uh, include loss of bush uh, for various reasons, uh, bushfires prescribed and otherwise uh, climate change and, uh, and disease. So there's a disease called American fowl brood, which is devastating to bee, bee colonies. Uh, but there's also the, the strong uh, likelihood that varroa mite will appear in uh, in Australia at some point. It has already, there's been one, one incursion. Um, so to me, to me, bees um, and also the, the trees on which, uh, the trees and bush on which they depend are a bit, you know, in terms of climate change, they're, they're the canaries in the, in the coal mine in many ways, you know. Flare, flowering is, is something that, um, flowering is something that trees do or, or plants do when they have plenty of resources. Producing nectar is something that plants do when they have plenty of resources. If they're under stress, then they stop producing flowers and they stop producing nectar to the same extent. Okay, so a bit, a bit more detail. Uh, beekeepers have to be registered. Uh, bees are considered as livestock. So they're completely, you know, like dairy cows, they're, they're uh, they they have to be fed in some way. Um, the, they the the honey is extracted off them, much like milk is. Um, hives need to be moved to flowering plants. You know, if you have a colony and it's got fifty thousand bees in it, you have to be constantly moving it to places that provide two resources: nectar, which is sugar, the energy, and poll pollen, which is the which is the protein and the and the fat. Mm -hmm. um, hobby beekeepers, do they also have to be registered? Yes, they do. Yeah. 
Uh, so hives are usually moved about six times a year, sometimes quite long distances, and I'll show you that in a second. Uh, commercial, commercial honey yields in Western Australia are greater than 200 kilo, uh, kg per hive per year, and that's, that's at world record levels. So uh, Western Australia is paradise for, for bees. Um, the food regulations that are sometimes ignored with honey, you know, in that um, people just go to farmers markets and sell honey and they don't necessarily have, have the certification and that's, that's potentially a problem. Apiary sites, uh, many private and publicly, uh, publicly registered apiary sites are held. So, so th as we'll see in a second, we, we know where the public apiary sites are, the ones that are run by DBCA. Uh, we're not sure what's going on with private sites, um, but th there's a bit of a game going on because b b apiary means uh, b. b. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so if if you imagine you're a you're a beekeeper, and there's a there's a national a big national park which has got lots of trees in it, so, so lots of uh, so say Jarrah or or Mary or or even it rarely uh, if it's flowering Carry, uh, then what you might do is talk to a farmer who has a farm that's close to the national park, uh, and get a private site there on the basis that bees can fly up to up to 10 kilometers and they're likely to find the flowering plants um, in the national park and bees can't read notices that say you know bees are not allowed in here or, or excluded from <laughs> from national parks so so there's all of that and, and also that means that um, to an extent all right you you have you have some degree of uh, renting a uh, apiary site from uh, DBCA, but um, it's, it's, it's a sort of common property because you can exclude other beekeepers from putting their hives, uh, putting their hives on your apiary site, uh, but you can't exclude the bees. So you find that there tends to be quite a lot of clustering of apiary sites and, and probably if we knew anything about it, there would also be a clustering of private sites around apiary sites and uh, lots of beekeepers you know telling their bees to build up their muscles so that they can fly uh, 20 kilometers and pick up the uh, uh, pick up the nectar um, uh, flowering is a very complicated event botanically uh, highly variable um, and this highly random uh, difficult to predict event uh, determines the determines the honey production. Um, an option is that uh, bees can be can be fed uh, pollen and and sugar. So if you if you run out of uh, flowering plants, and this typically happens in Europe over over winter, then you can start to feed bees. But that's problematic. It's expensive. Uh, and it's also um, uh, it also has led to problems with uh, con contamination of the the honey. Um, and uh, foraging depends on the weather and uh, daylight hours and the forage that's available. Okay, so structure of the industry. Uh, um, so this group here is the naught to uh, 50 hive beekeepers and there's 2,861 of those. So there's a very large number of amateur beekeepers and amateur beekeeping is taking off for reasons I don't quite understand but that it's taking, taking off as a, a hobby. Um, uh, but this this group, uh, so when we when we trace this the histogram down here, uh, there's actually very small numbers of beekeepers in this 
in this group, uh, sort of 50 to 100 and 100 to 200, and then 200, 200 to 400, it's, it actually gets down to very small numbers. If we look at the number of hives, the, uh, the, there's 31% of hives that are held by the, 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 amateur, uh, the amateur guys. Um, and then there's about 10% in each of these groups. The, you know, by the time you're getting up to 200 hives, you're starting to be viewed as, seri as sort of half serious. Uh, but then there's actually 20, about 23% in each of these groups here, where you have very few beekeepers. So 30, 36 beekeepers in this group and uh, 11 beekeepers in this group the group that have got over uh, 400 hives. But it's, it's actually these, uh, these two groups here, the above 200 hives um, and above 400 hives, where you could say they are the serious beekeepers. Those are the professionals. Um, so uh, just some... Uh, just some pictures to, to give you an idea about how, uh, how uh, hives are set up and how the hives interact with the bush. So Calbarry, that will be a winter, uh, uh, a winter um, foraging area for, for bees. Um, and they're, they're actually uh, foraging looking for nectar and pollen on the coast, coastal plain up there. Uh, Greenhead, a bit further south, is also a, a winter, uh, sort of autumn, winter and spring um, area where, 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 bees are, uh, where bees are kept. Uh, so, sorry, Ben, again, I couldn't have turned the question. Meaning, that means that the beehives are moved from wherever they are, and so not to be caught in winter, they are... Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so these types of sites are absolutely crucial to the honey industry because they provide uh, reliable foraging during the sort of late late autumn, early spring spring months, and it's it's these sites that are then determining the ability of bees to head off to other areas uh, and uh, I looked at this now and I can't I don't actually know where whale bing is but let's let's move over so they're moving out into places in the the wheat belt uh, they might be uh, located near canola trees for some guys or probably more importantly than they're, they're located in Jarrah and Mary forests uh, Either to either to the south or or to to the east, and I'll I'll show you a picture of the of the apiary site. Um, if you're a serious beekeeper, then you need a serious truck and a serious crane, and a large part of the business is transportation. Um, yeah, so so you you have to have the capacity to move lots of a hundred hives around to bet between your apiary sites. If you can't do that efficiently, then you're probably going to be un unprofitable. And I think uh, having a truck is probably what, having a serious truck and a serious crane is what distinguishes uh, the uh, smaller producers from the guys who, who uh, are substantial businesses. Just a quick uh, slide on the type of land used. So uh, unspecified, I obviously don't know what that is, but uh, un, um, what's, uh, unallocated crown land is it, uh, accounts for most of the apiary sites, so that would be probably out in the gold fields. Uh, the state forest is also important. Uh, nature reserves, uh, the pastoral areas, uh, national parks, and also con conservation parks. So this is uh, a map of the, um, the apiary sites uh, 
And so this is showing the apiary sites in uh, across the, the whole of the state, uh, and there's one, one or two, two up there. Uh, but you see there's a large cluster uh, al along the coastal plain and then into the Darling, uh, the Darling Ridge uh, through the Jarrah Jarra Forest uh, up to the, to the north here and in the, I think it's in the Avon, um, and then over in, over in the gold fields and then into the, into the, great, the great Southern. Um, and, and what beekeepers are doing is, is actually highly complicated, but to try and characterise it, then they, they follow sort of migratory paths through the state. But all, pretty well all those paths start off in this coastal plain area, you know, in the, win the winter and spring. And then, uh, and then they start to move, uh, they start to move south into Jarrah, if Jarrah's flowering, uh, and then uh, following the Jarrah down the uh, down to the south as the flowering events occur, and then they they move up into uh, possibly Mary up up here, and then always back to the coastal plain. So the the common feature in this this migratory path, and really the bottleneck for production is the coastal plain, uh, and this is a big issue because that's that's the area of native vegetation that's most under threat from development, uh, degradation, uh, and also from uh, bush, bushfires. Um, another, another path that is sometimes followed is again coastal plain, and then they head, they head to the south through the, uh, through the uh, Jarrah, and then they, then they, they do a big a big trip out to the gold fields uh, around Coolgardie, uh, and then again back to the coastal plain. Is this the, the really large producers who do this? Uh, it's, all, it's really large and medium, medium sized. A fair number of medium sized have to do the same. Yeah, bees have to be fed. If you've got 50,000 stingy things, you don't want them hungry. <laughs> Yes, massive distances. Well, it's just, uh, what I think is really striking is that the we've got in our society is 3% cleared. Yeah. And it was so obvious there about you know, how there's just absolutely nothing in the way. And they've actually got to be cleared. All of that would have been huge being country. So I think, I think to me an interesting thing is that talking to beekeepers, there's quite a few of them who are starting to no negotiate private apiary sites in the wheat belt. So suddenly farmers are realising, ah, hold on, you know, this, this bit of bush that, 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 that I can't clear has actually got a value. Uh, and coastal plain, then despite the fact that those sites are, can be removed by DBCA at any time and are subject, to, uh, are subject to prescribed burning from time to time, then the value of those sites in informal transfers, well, in, in transfers between beekeepers is about $30,000. So there's some serious value in, in the apiary sites there. So is this that diagram a bit misleading? Are, that, are those all the department sites? Yes. yes. Okay, I'm cutting this. <laughs> yes, this is a this is a biased sample, Michael. Is that, are you happy if I say that? Right. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so this is this is the pattern of public apiary sites. Uh, so you. Can, 
you can see that there's some, so the, the colored dots give the center of the site, but you can see that they're overlapping to some extent. There should be a three kilometer buffer between, between registered sites. So that's how DBCA determines where the sites are located. But if you own adjoining sites, then you can have your, you can have your sites closer. So this is just a, this is just a sample. Uh, this is what it this is what it looks like without the uh, buffer buffer zones around it, and then when we separate it out into what the beekeepers what the beekeepers own, then beekeepers tend to tend to want to cluster their sites uh, in. And that's not particularly clustered, but this one's this one's clustered and this one's clustered. They're basically clustering it so that they can operate along roads and and sort their transport out. Uh, the colour coding represents beekeepers, so we're just taking a sample of three beekeepers. So it's on public sites, but these are privately owned sites by individual beekeepers? Pub these are public sites and they are leased, leased to one beekeeper, to one beekeeper for, year. for an indefinite period. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's a bit like rock lobster yeah. quota. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, what do we know about honey production uh, across the states? Well, the, the short answer to that is uh, we do know quite a lot for 1992, but not nothing since then. <laughs> um, and that's because of a remarkable survey uh, by a remarkable character who's called Bob, Bob Manning, who used to work for DPIRD, uh, and he interviewed every beekeeper in the state, and he put, put together this this map because the technology of beekeeping has not changed then this is probably still valid valid information so uh, you can see the total number of hives here and uh, the total average honey production per hive uh, what what you tend to see is there's some honey production here up in the coastal plain but that's really to keep the bees over winter and then they're moving down here and this is where the larger productions come and then occasionally you get these massive productions down here which are on the carry. Um, uh, the carry has not flowered properly since 1978 so it's, uh, it, but when, when it flowers, it flowers for nine months so it's an extraordinary tree. Um, so that's, that's, where, that's where honey production is coming from. Some of the complexity, uh, you take a relatively small area of uh, apiary sites uh, around Boyup Brook, and this is some work that Brian Boroff did, uh, and Manita, uh, with, with you as well, wasn't it, Liz, uh, for this year? So just the, the only thing I want to point out here is the green ones are the, are the apiary sites, um, and you can see that apiary sites, for instance, these red ones here, can be not reissued. So having a lease on an apiary site doesn't guarantee you very much because DBCA, if they think for conservation reasons, they don't want to have lots of bees in, in a nature reserve, they'll just remove, the, uh, uh, they'll just remove the, the apiary site. The other thing that's absolutely st staggering, and this is what makes Western Australia so uh, unusual in this respect, is that the, the number of plants that, that provide nectar and pollen is very large and it varies from place to place. So there's 37 different plants that provide nectar and pollen just in this one site. Um, the flowering period, this is the other remarkable thing, is that probably one of the few, uh, the few places in the world where there's a honey industry and you get flowering, something flowering, even on this even on this site, which is quite a long way south, you get something flowering pretty well the whole of the year. Uh, the big hitters in here are the trees, so the, the Mary, the Jarra, and then after that you've got some important plants um, for winter, so the, the Banksias, uh, including Banks, Banksia grandis, which I think we've probably got just outside the door here, so the big, the big ban Banksias. Uh, Cheryl, Cheryl and I are trying to model some individual uh, apiary sites, so we're, we're going to be using 
uh, an apiary site uh, up near Eniaba, which is an overwintering site. And we're trying to make some sense of the vegetation that's there, which is highly, highly variable, uh, and to identify the major species that, uh, that provide uh, nectar, and, nectar and pollen. Um, okay, so just uh, in terms of finances, uh, Abe Bears um, undertook a, a survey of uh, bee, beekeepers in 2014-15. Uh, and a very limited sample for Western Australia of, of about 20 beekeepers um, and they, they had some small beekeepers and some medium-sized beekeepers. They didn't interview any of the, uh, the larger uh, beekeepers in terms of the number of hives. And uh, a couple of things to point out. Uh, first of all, it's honey production that's, that seems to be most important for, uh, uh, for, for West, Western Australia. Um, so that's accounting for the largest part of the income. Uh, if, you, if you look at the costs, then it's, it's mainly labour and, uh, and transport cost, and the largest part of labour is the imputed labour, which is, which is basically family labour. So, so honey bee production is predominantly a family, a family business, um, with some, even the bigger firms, uh, being very dominated by networks of of uh, family family uh, firms. Okay, theoretical model. So this is the model by uh, Champetier, uh, Sum Sumner, and Willen, um, and this is a North American model. So uh, the imports, labour, and capital, uh, where well, the capital, I would argue, is probably largely due to transport and also honey extraction. Uh, feeds into the bees, the bees produce honey, um, a honey harvest, but in their model then there's also, uh, there's also uh, pollination services uh, which are provided to crops like almonds uh, and, the, and, and, and apples. Uh, those crops provide forage for the bees, um, but pollination services generate a, a fee in itself. Um, so th this is quite a nice, uh, quite a nice model, uh, and, and because it's the, uh, uh, then th they then sw switched that to being uh, a pretty complicated um, uh, optimal control model, uh, where uh, they're trying to maximise the present value from uh, honey production and pollination services. Uh, and there's two state variables in this model. Um, the, uh, the first one is the, the population of bees, and the second one is the stock, is the stock of honey. Um, so this, this seems to be quite, quite an elegant model. Um, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, yes, I should have said that. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, uh, their, their decision variable is honey extraction. So it's like it's like fishing. You can uh, you can take out lots of honey from the hive, but then all your bees starve. So you have to you have to balance how much food there is there is in the hive in terms of the extraction process. Uh, and they also have this uh, other decision variable C K, uh, which is a culling um, decision variable, where they just decide how many hives they carry through the winter period because it's very expensive carrying bees through the winter period because you have to feed them. So that's, I, I didn't mention it because it's a North, North American issue. But just on that, do you, do you, you cull the hive or you just let them shrink down? You keep the, the stock of hives that you can expand back out again? Yeah. The same yeah, so you, you'd, probably, you'd have, probably have it so you just leave, in, in North America, you just leave enough winter bees to keep the queen warm. Yeah. Uh, and so that they're ready to go again in... April, May, when, when uh, the... They, they, they took uh, few families, so to say. Yeah. They combined several families. Yeah. Like, and then and they import from Australia. <laughs> 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 so, yes, yeah, so, sorry, they can also merge. Like in Canada, they don't, they're completely ineffective to keep them all winter, so they imported them from the United States. Yeah. 
Uh, so the, their model doesn't explicitly include land access, so uh, although they sort of include it as you're, you're, you're providing pollination services, uh, there's no idea of having dedicated apiary sites. Uh, in the Western Australian model, and I'm still trying to get my head around that, but an important activity is scouting ahead so that you know where things are flowering. And that's also expensive because people have got to get in cars and uh, drive, drive sometimes long distances around the state uh, trying to assess whether when the flowering event is going to occur. Because the last thing you want to do is to move a hundred hives somewhere and then have them all starve. Uh, so there's a value of information from scouting. Um, okay. Uh, focus of ours is sort of a willingness to pay for registered apiary sites. So the more, the more apiary sites you, you have, then probably your willingness to pay goes down and uh, and uh, the, the cutoff point is the annual fee that you have to pay DBCA so uh, in the southwest then the the annual fee is a hundred dollars per per year uh, and so if your apiary site is is worth less than that to you within your business then you'll just let it go back into the pool of apiary sites. And, and that happens quite frequently, especially with the carry sites where the, the, they, they have, they've had so many years when they don't produce very much. All right, so this is my, uh, this is my f attempt at trying to um, develop a sort of conceptual model for what's happening in Western Australia. Uh, this is sort of based on box whisker plots. Um, you have a sense that the, the coastal plain is absolutely critical. Uh, and then a beekeeper is assessing uh, whether they're able to move to, to Jarra if Jarra's flowering. Otherwise, they might delay and go from the coastal plain into, into Mary. And then they're, again, scouting ahead. How long is Mary going to carry on flowering? Is it producing any nectar? Am I getting the honey production off? Um, and so they're, they're, they're weighing up about whether they move uh, to the gold fields, if they've got apiary sites out there. Um, and then, uh, so that's, that's reasonably. Uh, Mary, uh, Jarrah is highly unreliable. Mary's very reliable. Gold fields is, is, is quite reliable. Um, and then they're, they're back to the coastal plain. And the, and the unknown is actually carry because historically that used to produce massive flows of, of honey, but it hasn't, hasn't flowered since 1978 at a serious level. So its, um, it's future as a, as a, as a honey, crop, uh, honey producing tree is, is a bit precarious. Um, okay, so I think I think any model that I produce has to be stochastic because there's so much variability in the system. And I think it also has to produce some information costs. It has to account for information costs and the sites available. Okay. Uh, to, uh, right, I'll just... Um, uh, I, can, I can introduce you to Pete. <laughs> Pete the beekeeper. <laughs> So uh, one, one of the ways we're trying to assess um, uh, the apiary sites is to use a simulation model uh, which accounts for the population build-up of bees as well as honey, as well as honey production uh, in terms of trying to value sites. Uh, so we've, we've taken this model from the University of Exeter uh, and we're gradually trying to uh, we're gradually trying to modify it so that it works for uh, works for Western Australia. And I'll uh, uh, it's at this point that things always crash, but uh, I'll just let it let it run for a while. So what what happens in this model is um, uh, you've got different patches of flowers. So when they look like this, they're dead. Uh, there's in fact just this one little pink patch that's producing stuff. Um, and these bars here are giving the, uh, the larvae and the larvae hatching out to become workers. So it gives the, 
the reallocation of tasks within the hive. Uh, it's based on weather data, uh, so, so it tells you how many hours of sunshine there is, and that determines the, uh, that determines the foraging time. Uh, and in this patch over here, it says whether, uh, whether a, a, a patch provides nectar or it provides whole, pollen. And also, interestingly, it counts for the fact that energy in a beehive leads to information, in that bees have to go out and find these patches. Uh, and if you think of yourself as a small bee, then it's, uh, then it's actually quite a, quite a big task. And I, I can see... Uh, Maxim's getting nervous, so I better. Uh, um, so one one thing, um, one thing. It uh, perhaps it's over, perhaps it's over here. Okay. Um, uh, colony structure. Let's try. Yeah. Okay. So that's. Uh, this this plot here shows how the colony allocates um, uh, allocates uh, pupae between um, the different the different jobs. So there's a hierarchy in a beehive. You start as an in how bee, and if you show if you show potential, then you become I think it's, you, be, you become a forager, uh, and and then you possibly become a scout. So a bee that actually goes and finds um, uh, finds uh, patches of nectar and uh, and pollen. Okay, so so that's that's how we're going to uh, do this, and I'll just skip just skip forward to what we're what we're planning to do next. Uh, we're trying to understand better the foraging landscape, and we want to ask beekeepers in the context of the apiary sites that they currently have, um, how much they'd be prepared to pay for other apiary sites which have got uh, particular characteristics. All right, I'll finish there, thank you.